This is the coolest flying V I have ever seen. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Man, searching reverb this morning, I found the most awesome flying V. I saw the price, I saw the specs, I fell in love, I had to buy it. But before I did, I wanted to make sure it was legit. Okay, so this is being advertised as a 1981 Gibson Flying V. So normally, a Flying V from this era will look like this. It's not that different from a 70s model. They'll have a pickguard on it, you've got two humbuckers, an 81 would have Tim Shaw's. You have the big rounded overhead stock that is ultra iconic. You have the three screw truss rod cover with the giant Gibson logo. And they are some of the best Flying Vs that have ever been made. And if you've tried a modern Flying V, try one of these things. They're just infinitely better. And a lot of it comes down to the neck angle and how it's joined to the body. There's actually a little bit of a standing ledge. So naturally, when you see something like this, it's like, whoa, <laughs> what is going on? However, there is a different model that kind of looked like this that also existed in 1981. It was called the V. Now, their headstocks were a little bit different. They only had the two screw truss rod covers. But like the one we're looking at today, they had a flamed maple top. They had the binding around them. They have these double cream dirty fingers pickups, and they have an interesting leg out down here. There's no pick guard on these bad boys. Because you can look at a few different examples, you can find some really awesome tops, and then there's some tops like this that are just okay. But the other cool thing about these weirdos is the fact that they are maple backs and maple necks. And I guess while we're being complete here, in 1981 there was also a reissue V, or better known as the Heritage Series Carinas. Obviously, 58 style here versus the 67 slash 70s style. Okay, so knowing that uh, the V exists, perhaps this was the prototype? Was it a NAM show display piece? Was it just a weird one-off custom order that somebody had a the V done up ultra fancily? So far, I was thinking this could potentially be legit. Because look at our headstock here. It obviously has a flame maple cap over it that maybe has a little bit of figuring to it, but not a lot, but they gave it the bursted headstock, so that's really cool. But look at this truss rod cover. It is custom made, apparently in wood, and then they have the Gibson logo inlaid in Mother of Pearl. But then look at our fretboard. That is an abalone shell. What's another model around this time that used abalone like that? A V Les Paul. You can look at them. I've documented quite a few of them. It made me start to believe, okay, this might be real. But it's being described as mint condition. And that really scares me. <laughs> I, I get it. If this is legit, I could imagine a guitar like this maybe not being played that much. It's more so a collector's piece or something to show off to your buddies. But we can see the absolutely pure gold pickups right here looking good. Our hardware's looking just as nice. Our control layout is very interesting on this particular one. And then look at this. We've got purfling around the edges that's also abalone. Now you guys gotta remember, the 80s is essentially the birth of the art guitars. We've documented quite a few of them in the late 80s. However, the early 80s and late 70s, you don't find this as often. Normally, you would see this on like overseas models, but it wasn't completely impossible if somebody did the custom order. Like sometimes the custom shop will do Les Pauls like these. For example, here's a Les Paul Ultima. Now granted, this one's from 2012. But you can see the same purfling around here. It's got all this crazy inlay stuff. I mean, art guitars are here. They can look like this or they can look like this. Now let's check out the backside. I can kind of see some mahogany wood grain going on here. We've got the volute that we should have. We can see it has some sort of a serial number, but the first thing I was looking for was one of these bad boys over here, Custom Shop Original or Custom Shop Edition. However, you need to know Gibson did not start using those until late 1982. So that's why I went back up here and I saw 1981. It's like, ugh, I hate this era because it's so hard to tell if things are legit or not. It's a little bit more of the Wild West as far as custom orders go, and you didn't see things like this too often. So then we move on to the back. We can see there's some sort of a control plate back here now because it's not a top routed V. And then as far as what the back of the guitar is made out of, I mean, it could kind of go either way. I kind of get some maple vibes, but at the same time, it could just be like a straight grain mahogany. I mean, it doesn't look like the mahogany wood grain here. So maybe, just maybe that is maple, but it has this. It's got the construction that a the V or a 70s flying V would have that I was telling you guys about earlier, how it stands proud of the body and it doesn't just completely sink in. So looking through all these photos, I mean, I'm just absolutely in love. I still don't have exactly enough information to make a determination here. So I decided to look, who is selling this? Is this some random Joe Schmo over in Lithuania? No, 
Oh, it's the Fellowship of Acoustics. Okay, so I've actually bought a Lefty Les Paul custom from them very recently. Had a great time with them. I know a lot of people that work at that shop also watch and like my show. So I was like, all right, I need to message these guys. But then as I was typing, I was like, oh, what if somebody beats me to the punch here? I better go to their website. When I first saw this, it had only been live for like 30 minutes. Because if this is legit, it could potentially be worth between 10 to 15,000 if everything plays out, you know, to the right collector. So me being at 65-ish, that's exactly where I want to be on a piece like that. So I asked him for a few additional photos. I was looking for things like the pickup cavities, the backside of the pickups, inside the back control cavity and close-ups of the pots. Of course, we need a serial number and any type of Made in USA stamp that might be present. We could see there was one there, but not a very good up-close photo. Underneath the truss rod cover, and hey, how about actually the back of that truss rod cover? Because a lot of times there's secret markings on the back of those, like with the whole The Les Paul thing, because Gibson outsourced that kind of work. So if it was legit, it would probably have something that would look familiar to me. And these guys were great with getting me photos. Played a little bit of Mario Golf 64, and after an hour and a half passes, I got the photos. And uh, my entire day was ruined, but I'm still happy that there was something to get me super excited. So here is what the back cavity looks like. We've got three pots. We've got a three-way toggle switch. We've got a switchcraft jack. And I'm liking the way that these are looking all frosty with age. However, then I saw this. We've got markings on the sides of the pots and we don't have anything on the top. Normally, we're looking for something that looks like this if it came out of Gibson. If you zoom in here, it says 137. That tells us CTS made the pot. And then we have our date codes. It looks like this one says 8105. That translates to 1981 production, fifth week of the year. So that's early February. I mean, Gibson used something like this in the 50s and 60s, but it's also 500K. A lot of times you'll actually find 300K pots in this era. That's why people swap them out. It's a very common process, but they're just all like this. So that is not the style Gibson would have been using at the time of this one's creation, or anywhere in the 80s for that matter. But then I saw this. All right, well, at least we got the Gibson braided wiring for our pickups. <laughs> That's looking a little bit good at least. But uh-oh, one, two holes? <laughs> you never see that. It's always a singular channel. And the reason why I call those black wires out is the fact that normally this era would look like this. They would have many different colors. For example, this one's got green for the jumpers here. They've got black leading to the switchcraft jack. And then normally the ground wire would have some sort of like a yellow. So seeing all this, it just gave me the heebie-jeebies. And honestly, the finish doesn't look exactly right at this time. However, now that I see the wood grain at this angle, that is most definitely mahogany. So incorrect pots, strange wiring channels here, but the capacitor looks about right. <laughs> so we got one small point here, but okay, maybe somebody just rewired this at some point in time. And we've seen weirder things than this happen in the past. But then we get to the pickup cavities. Something about this just doesn't look right. It almost looks like it's wax potted in here. But there was obviously some sort of a sticker right here. Now this is a good sign because sometimes you will find that in flying V's and other models because I think that's where they mounted it to the router machine if I remember correctly. Now these other three holes, I'm not entirely too sure. So I was a little bit worried at this point. But then this photo. <sighs> It, it ruined my entire day. Gibson USA. Nope, that base plate did not exist until the earliest of 1991. This is a modern era Gibson pickup. So that means for 1000% sure, all the electronics have been gutted and replaced in this guitar. Of course, you want to verify that, hey, it's not just one pickup that was replaced. So they showed us the neck pickup cavity. Again, kind of strange what's going on here. I, I don't understand why there's those pinholes. We've got the same kind of waxy look here, but there we go. Again, Gibson USA. However, one other good thing that we get from these photos is look at this. It actually has a real maple top. Now, it's not as thick as a Les Paul top, but we know it's a real maple top and not just some thin veneer that somebody slapped on some other flying V to make it look fancy. Now, it could technically still be that, and it's just a plain maple cap underneath here. That's how budget guitar manufacturers make their guitars look cool and still be able to advertise a proper maple top. So now we get to the truss rod cover. I was really interested in checking this out to see if it's some sort of a veneer or is actual wood. And this, yeah, 
that looks like real wood. But sadly, I'm, I'm not seeing any of the marks that I normally do. Now, it being unfinished on the back, that is correct. That's how the other ones were as well on the Les Pauls. But then I saw the truss rod. Things are looking good because we only have two screw holes right here. So there's no evidence of like the two screw version ever on this. However, you can tell there is an actual maple cap on this one, just like we are seeing on the body. And that is indeed a Gibson style truss rod. So this isn't just some weird fake. I mean, it could still potentially be legit, but modified. And thankfully, the truss rod itself actually appears to be in good shape. Okay. And next, they provided me with some serial number photos, which admittedly, they said it's kind of hard to decipher it. So they sent me six different photo angles. Love that. But this right here, my friends, was the final nail in the coffin. Blurry serial number. You should not have that on an 80s model. Now, sometimes you get weird looking hand stamped ones that are generally Kalamazoo made. That's how you know it's a special guitar. <laughs> like, check out my uh, super standard. That, that serial number always freaked me out. But now that I've seen enough of these weird custom guitars that were NAMM show pieces, I know it's legit. But this, that's a no-no. I mean, it looks like it says 83091, so it's a late 1981 so it's not early enough to be a prototype so we can throw that out the window and then i can't figure out what this digit is but then it looks like two four or something like that so unfortunately this is an important digit for us it tells us whether it's kalamazoo built or nashville if this whole number is 499 or less it's nashville and it looks like it could potentially be a zero. So that means uh, Randy Leonard can't help us out if it's not a Nashville piece, even if we could figure out what the serial number actually said. But it looks like I can just barely make out a Made in USA stamp vertically. So that tells us, yes, this was definitely Kalamazoo built. But look at this. And look at this. And this, and you guys know what that is. Those are dowels in the headstock for filling in other tuners in the guitar. And they're perfectly finished over. The serial number's blurry. That is a 100% confirmed, at least, at the very least, the back of the headstock has been refinished. And now our next photo here, making the guitar look as beautiful as ever, but this case... This case is not correct for this style of guitar. This looks like some sort of like a Dean mixed with Fender case. This is what an 80s Flying V case would look like. It'd have a nice red interior. They're nothing special. They're only expensive because they're rare to replace. Or you could have found this one. Assuming if it was a custom order NAM piece, it wouldn't be that unlikely that they would put a Lifton style reissue case with it like the Heritage series got. But this one, Definitely not. So let's add everything up here. The back of the neck confirmed refinished. There's no doubt about it. All the electronics have been replaced at some point in time. And we can also probably assume that the bridge and tailpiece have also been replaced. We can't for sure say that the top has been redone, but if somebody's willing to refinish the back of the neck and replace all these other electronics, it seems to be possible that they would also be willing to add new binding and purfling around the edges to make it ultra fancy. And I guess another way you could put this is this type of wood grain, this whole quiltiness, do you find that in the 80s? And the answer actually is yes. You find tops like these in the Heritage 80s series. So this didn't necessarily turn me off, except for the fact that it's almost perfectly book matched. Gibson just doesn't do that. So what do I think this started life as? The V or regular? I think it started life like this. Maybe not necessarily silver burst, but at some point in time, somebody wanted to make this a fancy boy. So when they take the pick guard off, it's gonna look something like this. You can't just have that going on. So they likely had to take maybe a little bit of wood off or maybe they just put a maple top over top of it. So putting a maple cap on this would hide all those routes. It makes sense. It also makes sense why they left this control layout alone instead of modifying it because all they had to do was route the backside of the guitar. Now the tuners, sometimes you can find the Schaller ones, but generally you find these, so maybe those filled in plugs were actually a replacement of a replacement of a replacement. But you definitely wouldn't see that on a stock original guitar. And I think I forgot to mention the fact that having an ABR1 bridge Gibson in 1981 is a huge deal. That's before the prehistoric era. There were very, very, very few guitars to have that stock from the factory. So pretty much the only thing that doesn't line up here is the 12th fret. 
Because if you look at this bad boy again here, this is why you can't take dot inlay fretboards and just route them out for like some other style of inlay. If you want a small block or a large block like a Les Paul Custom, which this guitar was going for the custom style large blocks. But if you were to try to do that here, you're actually going to have a half circle on each side exposed that you'll have to fill in, or you have to opt to make the blocks large enough to encompass all that, and then the whole guitar just looks janky because that's not how big they're supposed to be. I don't have a clear enough photo to see if that is there or if these blocks are a little bit larger than normal. However, I don't think it's that crazy to assume somebody willing to do this to also replace a whole fretboard to make it look good and put abalone inlay in it. So with a broken heart, I, I had to tell them, sorry, it's not legit. And then I typed all this out for them and they were kind enough to forward it to their advertising department to have them take a closer look at the guitar. Thankfully, they've actually decided to pull this down to do a little bit more research on their own to see if they can trace a little bit more of the history of this one. That's the sign of a great shop. A lot of places, if I would tell them, hey, something's not right here, they'd go buzz off. So hey, if you recognize this guitar or you know the luthier that did this work to it, please let us know. Because it is a cool piece regardless of any of the modifications that have happened. So now, all things considered, is it worth 6500 bucks? Normal V, unmodified, good shape, I mean it can sell between four and six and a half thousand. So I honestly think despite maybe not being exactly what they thought it was, they still priced it appropriately because this thing is sweet. Who cares if it didn't actually leave the factory like this? That is a showstopper for somebody who just wants an original 80s V that looks awesome. But unfortunately for me, I only collect original examples and, and having a fake in my collection, that's not exactly what I want. Although it is cool enough to display in a future museum or something. Might not be the 15 to twenty thousand dollar collectible we were hoping for but it's certainly a cool piece all right troglodytes i hope you enjoyed this journey with me today i know i did i always love it when there's interesting things even if they didn't leave the factory that way don't forget to like comment and subscribe and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one take care